Hey everyone, it's Gabrielle Flores. I'm here with the wonderful and inspirational Christopher Chu. Hey Christopher, how you doing? Hey, what's going on? Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for being here. Christopher Chu is a life coach among many other things. I'm gonna just have him jump in and tell us exactly what it is that he does. Go ahead, take um, the word. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's straight I'm to it. Threw you right in. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been uh, I've been specifically coaching men for the last three years. Um, I do Skype based coaching, in person coaching, workshops, and my latest invention of my evolution has been men's um, group retreats in South America with plant medicines, ayahuasca, San Pedro, and also uh, the frog medicine combo. So to tie it all together, I've been helping guys with emotional healing, finding their life purpose, opening up to emotional intelligence, getting better relationships, regrounding themselves. You know, we came from, I came from a very crazy, chaotic New York City lifestyle. And, Ooh, uh, yeah. yes, a fellow New Yorker, that's right. <laughs> so I'm still in the crazy concrete jungle. <laughs> And definitely finding spirituality and trying to keep the, I call it the Zen in the concrete jungle, right? Mm -hmm. Is actually mm -hmm. one of the most challenging things. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about, first of all, thank you so much for what you do because I'm a life coach for only females. Sorry guys. Um, and, <laughs> but that's why we have Christopher. Um, and I know that in the you know in this in our society it's actually very um harsh and challenging to be able to open up right and to be able mm -hmm. to be vulnerable right isn't that a, a challenge in itself so how did you get into your lifestyle so it's i'll start off from where i just left off so i i worked on wall street for eight years and you know that was after binghamton where i was good friend with your sister and that was the, yeah, like Glenda, shout out to you. So, that was the beginning of of the whole chasing the American dream, you know, the illusion of it. And you know, I come from immigrant parents. My dad's from Hong Kong, and my mom's from China. And I grew up in New York, and I was brought up on values of make money, hustle, you know, make it rain. And just get money and that's it and that's your job and career and like don't worry about passion or impact or service or your talents and so yeah i just i just took that narrative to heart and i was a good boy good son and i went for my mba and at baruch and did that at the same time so at the midst of all this of chasing that i suffered a collapse lung at age 28 29 and that was during the financial crisis of 2008 and that was pretty much the wake up call. That was my, uh, if you want to say, spiritual immune system kicking in and calling the bullshit that was in my life. And I got, I was gonna work for a month. I lost 20 pounds. I couldn't, I couldn't lift or go to work. They, they made me stay home. I was on painkillers. So I lost a lot of weight. And that kind of gave me some time to think about my life. But I didn't spend enough time thinking about the changes. So I jumped back into that lifestyle. And this lifestyle was fueled with, you know, partying and cocaine what? and drinking, the whole typical fast track rat race. So it then happened again, nine months later, the collapse song. That's when they really had to cut me open, perform heavy duty surgery. And I was out of work, I think, for almost two months this time. And that was like the big serious wake up call. That's when I was really like, all right, what the fuck am I doing with my life? And so, yeah, I read, I read some books. One, one book was by Renegade. Uh, career Renegade by Jonathan Fields. He's another life coach. And his book inspired me to because his story was like he was a high paced lawyer and he then changed to yoga and, and that brand. And that really inspired me, it planted a little seed in my head. And I was like, wow, someone else is doing something like that. I, that story really resonated with me that I don't need to just chase money, I can have a more fulfilling life. So at the end of my of my MBA, I asked my boss, hey, can I go take a take a vacation because I had just finished up grad school and had all this vacation signed up or saved up from not, from not working pretty much. And I just started getting into Muay Thai, which is Thai kickboxing. Amazing. And that's why I, <laughs> I love it. That's why I'm here in Thailand. So <clears throat> I came to Thailand for one month of vacation. It was more of a training vacation. I went to different 
Muay Thai schools in Bangkok, in Phuket, the beaches, and the mountains of Chiang Mai in the north. So for six weeks, I just trained Muay Thai at different gyms and got ingrained with Asian Thai culture. And at this is the trip that I then found my future meditation teacher. And that's the first time I tried meditation. And I was always into, I was always curious about meditation, spirituality, but I never had any time or anybody to really dive into that when I was in New York. So one of my mentors brought me to my meditation teacher and I tried it and I was just like, I felt something in that meditation. And I'm like, I need to come back here and explore that part of, of life and the human experience. So I went back to New York and, you know, that's when I was like, do I really want to continue going down this path, this empty path? And I read the book, Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, which I'd highly recommend your viewers to check out. That was like the other big shift I had in my belief system that you can work online, you can travel, you can be an entrepreneur, you can make money doing things that you love and are fulfilling and have a positive impact on society as a whole. So seven months later, I said, screw it. I quit my job, <laughs> got rid of my apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey, and I booked a one-way ticket to Thailand. And that's how I got to pretty much where I am today. That was the beginning of my spiritual path of, of this whole journey of healing and self-exploration. Oh my goodness. Okay, so first of all, if you're tuning in, uh, you just basically heard the dopest story about how a soul, right? Because that's what we are at the end of the day. Um, it, how a soul took this giant leap of faith. So I just wanted to kind of dive into something because I was just so inspired by your story. But you mentioned that you picked up the first book, which was Career, uh, Career, Renegade. Career Renegade. Career Renegade. I love that title. Wow, what a, what a title. Um, you mentioned that you picked up that book and that there were things that just began to resonate with you. Um, mm -hmm. For someone who is just beginning, right, sort of that, oh, man, I know that something in my life is not working, right? Sometimes it unfortunately takes extreme things like our health to really make these changes, right? But sometimes, you, do you find that the universe is always sort of sending us signs and downloads and being like, hey, you know, I don't want it to get to that crazy extreme point, you know, like, but I do want to send you things. Do you think that that book, it's just more of like, do you think that when things resonate with us, it's because we're actually remembering who we really are? Mm, yes, for sure. I like that. It, it's definitely, it, because it touches something deeper within us, you know, it's not a logical thing. It's, it's, it's like a transmission and download. So yeah, it's, it's our soul remembering, you know, who we are, our essence, our authentic self, because we've been, if you want to say conditioned or programmed by society, family, we, it builds layers, but when sometimes when there's art or a book or a person, a teacher that gives you some education or whatever, it touches you. Right. And so yeah, for sure, I definitely I like that. It definitely touches us. So you think that one of those tips, um, because I mean, there are people out there right now that maybe they are seeing the signs. Maybe they are, mm -hmm. you know, feeling like there's a book that's calling them, or maybe there's even hearing your story. What do you think are some tips to, to do the same in terms of really allowing themselves to sort of begin this process of, you know, awakening and change and, you know, and their evolution, if you will? It's a really good question. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways to, to approach this. Um, and the thing is, there's no one way or right way to do this. Right. So I would, I would say first thing to your users is just try something new. Get out of your comfort zone. That's the biggest thing. Learn something. And I think the way you can figure out what that is, is two things. One is passion. What is it that lights you up? For me, it was Muay Thai, kickboxing. I had never done a martial art before. And I used to travel. I would travel in one hour to go from Hoboken to New York City every Saturday, religiously. So that was like a no-brainer. I was like, wow, I fell in love with something. Some people, it might be like art or painting or dancing or whatever. Just, just try. If you already have something that, you're, that lights you up, I would say stick with that. Now, the other thing is some people don't have a passion. Like for me, I didn't really have anything passionate either. My passion was going out to the drugs and being a club rat, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I want to say to that, it's, I forgot who, I think it was um, – 
the author of uh, Eat, Pray, Love. What's her name? Elizabeth Gilbert. Yeah, she had a really good TED Talk. I listened to her podcast. And she, I like what she said. She said, we put so much pressure on people to find their passion and run with it. And if you're like, you're like me, who I didn't have a passion first, the second thing to start out with is, um, is create, is curiosity. Let curiosity lead you. Lead you. And, and that's another thing too, you know, go, tr that's why I say try different things. You don't know what's going to lead one thing down the other. It could be a rabbit hole. So I would say just get out of that comfort zone and try a bunch of different things until something eventually will resonate with you. So passion and curiosity, I think are the two biggest things. And, and it all comes down to stepping out of your comfort zone. You know, if I had never, it was a, a New Year's speech that inspired me to go try Muay Thai. And I was like, I don't know, I, it's going to be weird. I, I know I'm Asian, I was supposed to be good at martial arts, but uh, yeah, I've never done karate or kung fu, you know? So I went to my class and I was like all out of breath and I was, I, I, my technique was horrible, but I was like, fuck it, like, I'm just going to try it, you know? And I yeah. Was just, so, you know, just, just I just want to prime your, your viewers that listen, it might feel weird at first, it might feel different. And that's, that's good. That means it's a good thing lean into that weirdness because you'll be you'll it'll become normal but that's a good sign and that means you're stepping out of your comfort zone and and the thing is just always be i would say continue to always be an eternal seeker or, or a learner always be curious and, and want to learn about new things because that will then keep you on this path of evolving and, and finding new things so those are some basic um starting points i would say amazing tips and guidance for sure. And I like how you said, um, I love like, it's like follow the weirdness. Like, I love that. That's so amazing. Cause it's true. Like, you know, when do you really learn the most when you're uncomfortable and in the uncomfortableness, you actually find all the things that you have been like, you know, wanting to make room in your life. So mm -hmm. um, you also said be a seeker. I love that. Um, what would you like to see more of in the world? Talking about seeking, right? Like, what do you, what do you want to see? <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, there's so many things I want to say, but I think I'll, I'll tie it back to what my core mission is in terms of helping men and the world. So for me, it's, you know, we're in a really interesting point right now in society where if you look at the masculine feminine, it's yeah. way too <laughs> one extreme side and, and you see the impact of it look at the president look at the natural disasters look at freaking the hurricane coming in that's that's man-made climate change that's it's and so all this stuff that if you want to say the masculine has started it's, it's because of that so what i want to see more is is guys waking the fuck up like you know like Ooh, really yes to what's going on with themselves that change starts with themselves first and the reason why is you know it's it's every action has a reaction so I really want to see more guys wake up and and that means you know growing and, and healing a lot of the inner wounds that way they say hurt people hurt other people and that's a thing if you have a scared hurt little boy inside like what I did like what I had, and I still continue to heal. Um, if you don't start there, then these same patterns in the world are going to perpetuate, and we don't have a lot of time left to really fix these things. So, yeah, I would say what I want to see more in the world is, is guys opening up emotionally to themselves and, and doing the inner work, doing the inner healing. And that means also opening up to their brothers, their friends, other men, other support groups, because guys trying to do it alone, it's, it's not going to work. And, and I also want guys to open up to their partners, to their friends, to their loved ones, to their kids, to their employees, because when you take off that stoic mask or whatever mask we hide behind, that's when we can have more of this love and understanding and empathy and compassion in the world where relationships are healed. So that's, that's would be the biggest, and that's, like I said, that's what goes down to my coaching. That's why I want to help as many guys as I can, because I didn't, that's someone who I wanted to look, that's someone who I was seeking when I was first on this path. Someone to show me the ropes and initiate me and give me guidance. And, and so, yeah, it, it comes down to men take responsibility. That's what I want to see more in the world. 
That is beautiful. And what a mission. Very, very empowering mission. Um, I know that uh, a lot of guys, like I have a ton of guy friends who um, uh, just, it's what, what really is the deal? You know what I mean? Like I try to get it down to a science because I'm like, I have a lot of guy friends. I have a lot of girlfriends and things like that. Um, my clients, um, the reason why it's only female is because I think we male females, I don't think it's that we're competing or there's no versing. I think they want, uh, they, as you know, they want it to be that way because then we'll figure yeah. out that we're all just from one source and that's the essence of love, right? The unity. But, um, what do you think it is that really stops us from being like, hey, at the end of the day, I am a human having a, you know, an experience here and I need to just, you know, show up as my, you know, as my vulnerable self and show my challenges. Why do you think the masculine, right? tends to obviously conditioning and all these things, right? But why do you think that's still an issue till this day, even with all of the changes and the awakenings mm -hmm. and like that? Why do you think mm -hmm. there's still that resistance? That's, um, that's a really good question. Cause I've been, I've been, that's kind of like what I've been studying and trying to help helping guys. Mm -hmm. And I would say a big part of that, if you want to look at it in a historical context is the industrial revolution. Um, I'll briefly just talk about this real quick. When guys, if you look back at ancient civilizations, indigenous tribes, say look at Africa, Africa or like New Zealand, Australia, the Maoris, even Native Americans, they had rites of passages, the hero's journey, where they take little, they take boys and they initiate them in the wilderness with, with ceremonies. Um, and then they, they usher them into manhood, into what real manhood is, which is, Emotional, most not just physically being a man, but emotionally opening up that heart, and and, and that's what a real man is. So back then, you had all these, you had a tribe community raising a boy, as opposed to a single mother or a single father raising a boy like it is today. So back then, that was you had grandparents, you had healthy role models for little boys to look up to, grandparents, uncles, cousins, other other male figures. What happened is when the industrial revolution came husbands and fathers were sent to the factories so the bonding that happens between a father and a son it got broken and and you look at teachers how many teachers are men um it's a minority so most boys are being raised by women now i'm not saying that's a bad thing but what i'm saying is in order to raise a boy to be a man that has to be done by a man. It cannot be done by a woman. And like I said, I'm not trying to put a sexist spin on this. I'm just saying this is the hard cold facts. So what happened is you have society that's raised, that's a fucked up society with unhealthy male figures. You have basically little boys who are grown ass men who are such as celebrities, such as politicians, such as CEOs. These guys who are making the money and whatnot, these are the eyeballs, the attention, little boys go to, and like, wow, that's a healthy masculine guy. And it's like, no, it's not. It appears on the outside. So guys get this unhealthy template of what is to be a man by looking at these unhealthy guys. And then on top of that, boys are raised sometimes in a female um, community. So they're not giving a figure. So that's why some guys are on too much on the, I would say, not sensor side, but too much on the soft side. They don't have a, a backbone. That they don't. They're afraid to use their masculine power. And then you have the opposite side of guys who are hyper masculine, who you know are the ones that are afraid to open up. And and so you have this extreme rift, extremes, and and that's why it's hard for guys to say open up or be vulnerable or connect with another guy emotionally. Um, that's why guys are homophobic. So you have all these. On a, general, on a general level, it's because we've lost these initiations, heroes' journeys. So that's why guys have not, they don't have a, there's not life coaches teaching this stuff in, in high school. They're teaching us bullshit subjects. Like, Thank you. you know, Thank you, know, you like Christian. How to memorize yes. crap, you know? <laughs> yes. So that's, that's why on a mass scale, um, we don't have um, 
Sorry. สวัสดีครับ Hello. I'm on a I'm on a phone. I'm on an interview right now. So, wow, so good. Let's go see now. So good. I'm I'm on a, a video. I'm not there yet. I'm on a call right now. <laughs> this is my this is my Thai friend. Say hey. hello. Hi friend. Hi. Hi yeah. friends. <laughs> <laughs> Nice to meet you. New York. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Come, come. Oh, see, guys. I love the authenticity. That's how we roll authentically. Beautiful. So back to the the original topic. It was so yeah. It's it's hard for guys, including myself. I didn't have. A healthy father figure to show me these things, you know, and nothing to say bad against my father. He was he did an amazing job raising. It's he, his father, my grandfather didn't have teach him the ropes, and my great grandfather didn't. So this is why in a society, and this is the thing: if you look at women, women have support groups. It's it's so it's okay for women to talk about their emotions. It's it's like I said, these stereotypes that are ingrained at a very young age. That's why it's hard for guys to open up. Slowly, it's happening, but you know, there's organizations such as Mankind Project, um, nonprofit groups, my my coaching. There's other other men coaches I know also. It's called it's called men's work. So this is what we're trying to fix. But yeah, if you look at the root of the problem, one of the problems is the Dutch Revolution and and the lack of male initiation rites of passages. That is incredible. I love what you said about how what when you defined what a real man is. You said it's when he emotionally opens up to his heart. I'm yeah. like, wow! Like that's like we're gonna talk about tweet moment. That's a <laughs> like absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. Um, you know what's interesting is now that I've seen it from that perspective, because I've actually have you know I've always wondered um, because I myself have um, I, I you know um, I come from a Dominant Latina family, you know, and my my family is very very happy. Believe me, I have a hundred and one year old grandmother. I saw that. Rocking, yeah, she is still <laughs> she's got an amazing attitude. I am so blessed, but I do find that culturally speaking, right? I, you know, I'm American, New Yorker, all that good stuff. I find that it's actually still. You know, shunned upon to talk about your feelings, right? Like mm. somehow, like if you don't talk about it, they mysteriously go away. Like it's just like, oh, there they are. Okay, we'll just let them <laughs> underneath. We don't talk about our feelings, you know. So I myself know that in the process of having to, you know, be vulnerable. So what I think is interesting is that even though we men and women have different languages, right, and different. Ways of viewing things. I really think we're all still uniting, uniting in a pressurized society that's basically pushing us all to be strong. And strength maybe is defined in yeah. don't talk about your feelings. Maybe strength is defined as just keep going forward and just you got to keep making the money and don't let anyone know that you're weak. Right? Yeah, man up. It's right. It's but even like you know, both women and men. Like if you have a single mother who has to go to work and then take care of the kids and has to do all this stuff, like that's that she she wants to blow her brains out. Let's not get it twisted because there's a lot. But she's being pressurized from a society that's telling her man up, right? So it's like I think that there is this toxic idea, and I think it's being fed to both men and women about yeah. strength. And the definition of strength. So, um, you mentioned challenges, right? That you went through. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of those challenges? Like anything that you would like to sort of, uh, like maybe a challenge you'd like to give to someone who is just like, you know, what Christopher? Someone that's watching right now and they're saying, "I love this guy. He's got great energy. He's like really getting me there. Like I'm ready to be open and emotionally open to my heart." But I I'm going through something, and I don't know if that something is, you know, something worth talking about, or maybe I'm embarrassed to talk about. So maybe by you sharing something, you know, sure. we'll start that open combo or that open sharing. Definitely, I think 
I'll share some, I'll share two things from my childhood, which are related. Okay. And I think that's an important topic because everyone who goes on this path eventually, I would say most of the time people are going to find it relates to childhood. Some that, something that traumatized us. And for me, that was growing up Asian American in the eighties, I'm 39 years old, growing up the Asian as the only Asian American in upstate New York, where it's predominantly white or black, there's no Asian people around. So I was constantly bullied, harassed, called names. And that really had a negative effect on my self-esteem, my self-love. I, I just felt alone and like an outcast pretty much. Even during Binghamton when I was there, I still felt a, like I didn't belong there. So that really, I would say that really had an effect on me and that was probably one of the challenges that I had to overcome in the past six years. That definitely was one of the reasons why I, when I felt, when I came to Asia, I was like, holy shit, everyone looks like me. <laughs> I don't, it was the first, obviously everyone looks like me in Thailand. I'm Chinese, but like there's Thai, Chinese, and, and we're Asian. Anyways, I was just like, holy shit, this is the first time I didn't feel out of place. And like, I remember that stress, like just melted off my shoulders and I could just be myself. And so, yeah, I would say, you know, that was a really hard thing dealing with. And that's what led me, I had to get a dating coach at age like 30 because I had a lot of self-limiting beliefs that such as I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable, I'm not attractive. You know, all this negative programming from not just the people at school, but also the, the media, you know, all these stereotypes about Asian guys. That was really something I had. That was probably one of the biggest obstacles that I had to overcome when I came to Asia. And in relation to that is the other thing is my relationship with my father. I think most guys can, can relate to that at some level. I am the oldest of, of three, guys, three boys, and so my father is a very, <laughs> growing up, he's loosened up a bit, but he was a very strict Asian dad. And, you know, strict Asian dads, they scared the shit out of me when I was a very young age. <laughs> and so, uh, so, yeah, at, even while I was at school, I didn't have a safe place. And, even, and then at home, I didn't feel like I was in a safe environment. And that relates to my dad was very fractured um, growing up. So I couldn't, I didn't feel safe to ask him for support or open up to him. Like physically he was there, he provided for us, you know, but on an emotional level, there was nothing. And I harbored a lot of anger and resentment um, through childhood all the way up until Thailand. So, you know, these emotions, these heavy, the heaviness that I carried around, that anger, resentment, I didn't realize it until I got to Thailand, but that was part of the, the weight on my shoulders that I was carrying, all that. So that relationship, I really had to heal. And, um, and so when I came to Thailand, those are the two things I worked on, the two challenges, my, my childhood dealing with racism and then with my father. And, and they were very linked together. Um, they affected all sorts, whether it's relationship with women or business or relationship myself. They were all affected by those events, by that trauma in childhood. So... Yeah, that was part of the big part of the healing journey. That's why I, I went to do meditation at a temple to kind of let that cathartic anger out. And then when I went to Peru the first time to sit with Mother Ayahuasca and Grandpa San Pedro, that is when I let the sadness and grief out from the childhood. And that's when I also got in touch with my heart. But it came down to, I would say, self-love, which I was lacking. And self-love is related to self-esteem, you know, confidence, everything. And so, yeah, if you don't love yourself on a deep level, if you don't accept who you are on a deep level, you're, it's going to be a very difficult life. And so, yeah, I would say, you know, look back on your childhood, see what wounds are there, what things trigger you, um, what, what situations, because that's usually a hint as to like where to start looking for what, you know, what challenges you are going to have to face. Christopher, thank you so much for sharing that um, because that is such a, you're right, it does start from childhood. And shout out to the parents who are doing the best that they can. I mean, yes, definitely. <laughs> because they're, you definitely. Know, I feel like we are very uh, fortunate and lucky and blessed yeah. that we live in a society now where we can go off and find our hero's path, right? To awakening ourselves, becoming better, like, 
I don't think our parents had that luxury. That's why, you know, they didn't have things um, available to them the way that we do. Like, so, um, you know, shout out to that. And amazing that you were very vulnerable and open through your process. You did mention Mother Ayahuasca. So... <laughs> Basically, um, for those who know, I have talked about ayahuasca. I've actually never have tried it um, because I was actually told to not try it because I would have the opposite effect. I, um, I'm a weirdo like that. <laughs> like, you know how like you take certain things that are, they say this is what it's going to do for you? I get the opposite. So like um, for me, I live a very conscious lifestyle. I'm a vegan, all that good stuff. Um, and I actually have been sober for uh, three years. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do any of that stuff. But I do tell people, and I do tell my clients, I say, I am not only am I those things, but I'm also non judgmental. And why do I say that? Because I believe that in our path to awakening ourselves, there is going to be a road that you may take. For me, the road that I took was self destructive. And the path that I went on that sort of destroyed me, made me, re like it rebirthed me, it renewed me. So that worked for me. That may not work for you. So I always say, if there are alternatives and you find reputable sources and it resonates with you and you're like, I want to do this, not for the hype, right? Because there is always the hype, the trend and things like that, but really being like, you know what? I actually resonate with this. So for those who have never taken ayahuasca like myself and nothing wrong with it, tell us about Mother Ayahuasca and your experience. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, there's so many. Ayahuasca, it's such a varied experience for everybody. You know, it's two people that have the, the same ceremony have completely different experiences. So I just want to preface that when I, when I share, like, don't, I don't want to influence anybody or, that's right. Just, this is your but, specific experience, and we're not promoting it. We're just saying that there's an alternative, and if only if it resonates with you. And please do not go off and do it because you want to, yeah. you know, do it for other reasons than you know healing, right? That's why you did yeah. Mother Ayahuasca is for simply for finding yeah, okay. something. I think it's like breaking you open, right? Is that yeah. sort of the experience of it? Exactly, and. The first time I went in Peru, it was 2014. So, you know, we're in the jungle, the Amazon, in the middle of nowhere. And you're with the Shipibo tribe, which is the indigenous tribe that, that are the shamans. And they've been doing this for you know, hundreds of years, maybe thousands. And you're sitting in a very ceremonial, setting environment in Maloka. And yeah, you, you're fasting, you're, you're eating a vegan diet, you're meditating, you're being very mindful of your actions throughout the day. And then at nighttime, you sit in ceremony with about 20 people um, at that retreat, and it was 12 days. And through the 12 days, we had seven ceremonies, and um, it was a very healing experience because, like I said, for me, I was able to let go a lot of that grief. I would describe it as the shamans, they will come up and, and sing these songs to you in your ceremony. They're called the Icaros, and those are the songs that they communicate with the spirits and, and the plants, and it, the way I would describe it is the the one sweet there was three ladies there three shaman ladies two other shaman guys and the sweet ladies they were like they were like uh, little abuelas you know they were these older 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 women like in the sixties seventies and really short but beautiful voices almost angelic and I remember they come up individually and they sit in front of you and they sing and it I would say it felt like she was singing directly to my heart and that was the first time anybody I ever felt like that that someone was like that kind of gentle to my heart because I didn't even treat myself like that and I would say by doing that I was able to release the sadness and grief that I had been harboring from childhood and um yeah that was that was a big part of the healing journey of coming to face that reconnecting to the heart you know of, of the innocence of a, the little boy of a child and and just loving myself from a deep place and so yeah that that was the first time. And then directly after that, as I mentioned, I was still in Peru, but I went to the Sacred Valley, which is Cusco. And that's in the Andes Mountains, beautiful Andes Mountains. That's where Machu Picchu is. And that's where I got to sit with the second, with the other medicine, San Pedro, which is the cactus medicine. And that, I would say, was very big in, 
um, if you say ayahuasca detox, all the heavy negative stuff, you could say San Pedro then filled it up with love, you know? So ayahuasca detoxed me and San Pedro filled me up with that good love energy. And so, yeah, they work in a very powerful tandem. And that's why I still continue to work with these medicines. I would say, especially San Pedro, um, that has really helped me to further my connection with, with nature and myself and, and my heart. It's a very, it causes a lot of empathy and compassion with you, but people become even more sensitive to the emotions and, and each other. And I think especially for guys, that's why San Pedro can be just as powerful um, of a plant teacher, plant medicine. Um, so yeah, those two medicines, that's, they've been huge with my, my healing. Beautiful. And you do, um, do these on your retreats that you mentioned earlier. Um, are they, are they, uh, 12 days or do they vary in the days? Like how long does your, the retreats that you host, how long are they? I did three this year and, um, the first one was 12 and then I had a private client and we did a three and a half week retreat. Um, and then third retreat was eight days with three guys. So yeah, they vary from eight to 12, but I, 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 I can custom tailor it to the client's needs, but typically they're, they're 12 days. Wow. So Christopher, where do you see yourself going in the future? In the future? Like how far in the future? Like I know, years? right? I was going to say, we are <laughs> so only live in the present moment, right? Uh, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe like, you know, the near future, like, where do you see, just where do you see yourself? Cause I mean, it's so interesting that your journey kind of started you off on one path. And I'm sure that in your mind at that time, right. You were like, this is it. Like, this is, <laughs> this is it. This is what we're doing. Right. Yeah. And I bet, I mean, at the time you probably felt like there was no other path until you yeah. took that other path. Right. So exactly. do you still see yourself in the future on this same path? Do you see yourself continuing to be uh, open? And what, what do you see? I you like to see. How about that? <laughs> what I like to see. All right, cool. It, this is a fun thing because I always like to imagine the future yeah. and, and fantasize, yes. And visualize. Yes, so intention. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would say, let's just say like five years from now, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm open to things, but I would like to continue walk this path of continuing to help men with the retreats. But on, cause for me, I'm, I'm an eternal learner. So I like to dive deeper into topics, learn more. So it's just more about finding different modalities of healing and, and growth, such as breath work or, because I love plant medicines, but I also want to incorporate other modalities on top of that. So yeah, I would say for me, it's, it's, doing the retreats, but doing them maybe, have maybe four big retreats throughout the year. One, say, like in Japan, one in South America, one in Europe, and one in the U.S. Like, have, like, a rustic lounge of, like, 20, 30 guys, and have also, like, an all-star team of coaches and mentors lead with me, you know, and and do four big these events throughout the year. And that's, that's what I would like to see myself. And then also, I'm single right now, so I would, I, I would like to uh, meet... <laughs> so uh that's definitely part of the plan is to have somebody that's on a very similar path you know that is a healer or a coach or some kind of teacher that's really on her mission and her purpose um that enjoys traveling and is open-minded and wants to grow and and be in a constant relationship that's a big thing for me so yeah that i would say those two things are on my um a vision board. On your vision board. Yes, yeah. I love that. Um, so it's interesting. You did mention your single. Ladies, if you are watching, he is not only is he emotionally open and helping the guys out there for the for all women, okay? Because it's like, yay, we basically Christopher is a hero, okay? So what exactly would you like to share something to the audience that is of great value. So you mentioned about being single. What about those who are like in their process? I know that some people hate being single because they're like, oh my goodness, especially when you're a healer or you're spiritual or you're 
opening up, right, to this brand new world. And there's still people that are at that low vibe and you say something to them and they're like, so you do drugs? Like, <laughs> like no, I'm just trying to be open with you. What do yeah. you mean? You're being open? Like, you're, yeah, like, you know. So what would you say as um, to someone who, because I know that the single journey, people don't realize that, they, people think it's like, oh, you, you're free. You get to do whatever you want. And it's like, yeah, you're right. But there's also that part of us that is really trying to say, like, I'm doing the work for self, but I also am making the space for more love, right? Mm -hmm. And so what would you say to someone who is single or maybe is in a relationship and, you know, just someone who is trying to make that sort of space for more love? What, what would you share? you know, that would be of great value. To someone, I'm sorry, I'm a bit, I'm a bit confused about the question. <laughs> <laughs> so basically he's like, ah, uh, yeah. So wait, no, so what would you say to somebody like that's on the, like for, for you, for instance, right? Uh -huh. You're single, I'm sure you're, you said you're making space for more love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the journey to finding that person probably, comes with its fair share of challenges sometimes, right? So what would you say to someone um, in terms that needs that sort of like, uh, is it ever going to happen is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I see, all right, I get you know the what I'm saying? Is it, is it gonna I'm happen? <laughs> in, this, there. in this lifetime. Is it gonna happen, all right? Because we're working on ourselves, we're yeah. getting there, we're like, where are you making the space, functionally yeah. decluttered, where yeah. are you? That's what I'm it's saying. Funny. It's funny you say that, because I've actually had to like deal with that myself. That's what saying. I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, a, it's definitely a, tough. It's a collective thing, right? It's definitely it's a collective tough. thing. So what would, you, what would you say? What would I say to that? Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm making you think today. <laughs> you are. This one, this one's like a stumper right here. I would say, I would say first is, uh, you know, you got to be patient. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, be patient because that's what I've had to learn is, is be patient. You know, I, You're a New Yorker being patient yeah, or a New Yorker? That's, that's tough. That's you know. the thing, right? New Yorkers, we're on that fast pace. We like got our yeah. coffee, everything, <laughs> like in five minutes. You know what I mean? Exactly. Even when we're ordering our coffee, if you're not fast enough when you're ordering your coffee, they'd be looking at you like, <laughs> all right, next person. You know what I mean? So move, move it. So patience, right? Patience. What do you, what if people are like, I've been waiting my, <laughs> so long. Where? <laughs> Where is he or she? <laughs> yeah, like patience. I mean, yeah, of course. But how do you, like, how do you stay how do you stay grounded when grounded. you are yeah. patient? I would say um, one thing I, I remember reading this one article, it was like, it shifted the way I looked at being single. It was uh, being single is not a weakness. It's actually a strength because it means that you're not willing to settle for something, for someone who's not meeting your standards. And for me, I do have high standards, you know? <laughs> so I, I've changed that shift from being like, oh, I'm so lonely, I'm so weak. To be like, yo, I know she's out there waiting for me. Eventually, we're gonna cross paths. I just gotta be patient. I just gotta continue doing the work. But I'm not gonna settle for, you know, that low conscious thing over <laughs> stuff going on over there. Like, I don't want that drama. Like, I'm gonna right. wait till you know. So I would say, just shift the way you look at being single and enjoy being single because I think that's the other thing I learned also. Because I would say I was a needy guy before this. I would say learning to be by yourself and, and love yourself and be okay with spending time by yourself, that is really crucial to this journey. Because if you're searching for somebody to give you that fulfillment, to give you that love, you're always going to be in this cycle. And that's a lesson I've had. To always, I've had a, I've had a, the, the universe has hit me on the head with that freaking lesson a couple of times. This past <laughs> relationship. So that's the thing. It's like, you need to realize that, this happiness that you're seeking, it has to come from within first. You have to be a whole person first before you, so you meet, when you meet another whole person, you're like that, you're not a half of a half and trying to be codependent on each other. 
So that, that, those are the couple of beliefs that have helped me that I remind myself when sometimes I feel like, you know, I see a cute couple over there and I'm like, how about something like that, you know? But yeah, I trust the universe that I'll meet the right person. And, and the thing is, I look back these last six years, I have met some amazing women. And, you know, like, so, yeah, I'm really lucky. And like, I feel blessed. So like, just thinking about them. Um, and so like, if I was, that, that, that evidence right there, listen, like, I don't have to put pressure on myself to like, go and actively seek this out. Like, I continue working on my journey and, and we're going to meet eventually. So yeah, patience, have self-love and, and trust the process. Amazing. Wow, Christopher, totally amazing. Thank you so much for being part of this interview. You are phenomenal. I'm sure you get that often. Um, I know that so many people will be inspired by your story and by your journey. Um, do you wanna to share to the audience your website and how they can get in touch with you? Sure, social media. Um, you can find me on Facebook first. My personal page is Christopher W space Chu, C-H-I-U. Um, just send me a message just so I know who you are. Sometimes I get really crazy looking profiles. I'm like, how did this person find me? And then, uh, my two public pro, uh, websites are ChristopherWChu.com, that's C-H-I-U, and the other one for the med retreats, HeroesJourneyExperience.com. Those are the two ways to find me there. And then also my Instagram, which I've been working on, I'm going to blow it up soon. It's uh, ChristopherWChu as well. So those are the four main things. I also have a YouTube channel, but you can find that from my, um, from my website as well. But yeah, social media, that's what uh, the... Um, that's how to get a hold of me, find out what I'm up to. I always like to share content that helps people, inspires people, educates them, especially the guys. That's like really who my content's for. So yeah, just hit, connect with me and ask me questions because that's how I can find out how to help people. So, you know, let me know what you need help with because that's, that's what I'm here for. Amazing. And we really appreciate your time and the space to provide all of your healing out to this world because this world surely definitely needs it. I'm so grateful. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I cannot wait for you guys to um, check out more of Christopher. I know that he's got a lot that he's going to be doing. So um, we're, I'm super grateful for your light and just keep shining and rocking. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Peace and love. <laughs>